I love the complex numbers. They're beautiful and incredibly useful in so many applications. But when you first start seeing complex numbers, they can seem kind of strange. So in this video, I want to make the complex numbers feel a bit more concrete by comparing them to something that's a little bit more familiar, something called linear transformations. Let me show you what I mean, but first, a quick review. Complex numbers originate by trying to solve the equation x squared equal to minus 1, and there's no real number that can do it. But what you could do is define a symbol called, for example, the imaginary number i to be the square root of minus 1. What's really interesting is that if I take a different polynomial, like how about this quadratic, if you take that polynomial, okay, you're not going to be able to easily factor it, but you can use the quadratic formula, and the quadratic formula simplifies something with a square root of minus 1 in it, and so 1 plus or minus 2i. In other words, the introduction of the imaginary number i has now also solved this quadratic. And amazingly, it doesn't matter how complicated our polynomial is, x to any power of n, our coefficients can be real numbers, they can be complex numbers, the introduction of i solves all of them. The solution to this can just be given as a list of complex numbers, we typically call them z, that are of the form a plus i b. So the introduction of this one imaginary number i solved all roots for all polynomials. And I can visualize complex numbers on what something's called the complex plane. The idea is you have a real axis, and then you also have an imaginary axis. So if I put on the screen a point like 1 plus 2i, this is just an instruction that says go 1 along the real axis and go 2 along the imaginary axis. And doing this might seem very similar to what we typically call the real plane, which also looks like it has two axes, and a point we might instead write as something like 1, 2 to indicate a point on the real plane. So we have the real plane, all pairs a, b. We have the complex plane, which is pairs of the form a plus i, b. I mean, as a set of points are the same. In fact, there's a function that goes between them. It just says take a, b to a plus i, b. This function is called bijective. It hits every single number of the complex plane, and it hits it once. And so from the level of sets, these two are kind of indistinguishable. But in mathematics, we consider more than just sets. We ask, can we do addition on these sets? Can we multiply on these sets? What structure do our sets have? And for example, both of these have an additive structure. In the real numbers, if I take a point, say, 2, 1, and a point minus 1, 1, I can add those together. Addition in the real plane works by adding the first components and then adding the second components that's going to leave me with a point like 1, 2. And we often add a nice sort of visual to this, like we kind of imagine there are vectors going from the origin to the points. And if you add those vectors in a tip-to-tail way, that's going to lead you to the vector that goes to this point 1, 2. So in other words, the additive structure to do it in complete generality is to take AB plus CD, you add the first components to get AC, and the second components to get BD. What about the complex numbers? Well, it's basically the same thing. Say 2 plus i times 1 plus uh, minus 1 plus i times 1. This is just 1 plus i times 2. You add the first components, which are both the reals, and then you add the imaginary components together. And if I do this in generality, I mean, you, you, other than the fact that one is written as pairs with a comma and the other one's got the a plus i b, I mean, they have the same first component, they have the same second component, they look exactly the same. And ultimately, the way we express this in mathematics formally is, remember that function that went between the two? Well, if I say what happens if I take this function and I add two things, a, b plus c, d, well, I can do that addition in the real plane and get a, c plus b, d. If I take the function that's going to give me this complex number, remember, a function takes the pairs of real numbers and spits out a complex number, I can rearrange that a little bit nicer so it's the form a plus i, b and c plus i, d, and then that's just what the function would do to a, b, plus what the function would do to c, d. I'm using the plus sign in different ways, like if I'm adding two vectors in the real plane, that's what happens on the inside, and then this is just the same thing as taking f of the first number, f of the second number, and adding them as complex numbers. In my previous video, I introduced the idea of what an isomorphism was, and in particular, when you had a bijection between two sets, you might ask, well, what are the additive structures on those two sets? And if you had a function that played nice with those additive structures, so f of the sum was the sum of the two f's, then it was called an isomorphism of additive groups, and this was our notion of these two objects being equivalent 
from the perspective of addition. So indeed, the complex numbers and the real plane are isomorphic as additive groups. But the complex plane has a different algebraic structure on it. I can multiply. If I take a plus ib and I multiply c plus id, okay, it expands out like this, notice that there's an i squared in it. Well, we define i to be the square root of minus 1. So i squared is minus 1. And indeed, if I rearrange that, I'm just going to get this value. What about for the real plane? Well, the real plane doesn't have a standard or natural notion of multiplication. I mean, I could artificially impose a multiplication. I mean, I could do something like this. But it doesn't have a natural geometric meaning that would make sense for us to do this. Indeed, you might try to come up with a multiplication some other way, like uh, multiply the first components and then multiply the second components. Again, that's fine, but it doesn't have this lovely meaning that we would use all the time if it were not for the fact that we were comparing to the complex numbers. And so now we have a difference. The complex numbers and the real plane may be similar in their additive structure, but they are not similar in their multiplicative structure. And the fancy way to say this is that they are not isomorphic as rings. Rings is just our fancy term in abstract algebra for objects that have, with some nice rules, an addition and a multiplication. Okay, so I've been taking you down this journey that the real plane and the complex numbers are not the same thing at the end, but are the complex numbers actually the same thing as something else that we do understand? So now I have to introduce you to the idea of matrices. So matrices are typically written as four numbers A, B, C, D, and these represent linear transformations of the two-dimensional plane. Depending on the value of A, B, C, and D here, you get all sorts of really pretty ways to transform the plane. What we're going to focus on is not all matrices, I mean there's four numbers here. I'm going to focus on matrices that look like this. A minus B, B and A. And my claim is that matrices that look like this are in many ways equivalent to the complex numbers. For example, there's this function that takes a matrix of that form, A minus B, B, A, and it sends it to A plus IV. This is a bijection from the perspective of sets. They are the same. Okay, now we have to ask, are they the same in terms of their additive structure? And what about their multiplicative structure? If I take something like this matrix, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, so that maps to 0 plus 1 times i, or in other words, just becomes the number i. If I then multiply by another matrix, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, that would be like multiplying by i again. Now as imaginary numbers, we know that i times i equals minus 1. Matrices also can multiply, I'll link down below my linear algebra playlist if you want to learn more about that, but they're going to multiply out to minus 1, 0, 0, 1, which sort of is the thing that maps to minus 1. So you can kind of see that matrices of this type are looking a lot like complex numbers, and not only is there going to be an addition of matrices, there's actually a multiplication of matrices. So let's verify they've got the same additive structures and then multiplicative structures, and then we'll look at the geometric picture, which is the part that I like most. Okay, additive structure first. If I take one matrix of this form and add to it another, well, Addition of matrices is very easy, you just add them component by component. If I then apply my function to transform the first matrix, it goes to A plus IB, the second matrix goes to C plus ID, and if you go and add those together as complex numbers, you get A plus C plus I, B plus D, and comparing the two results, yeah, the, the function works on the right-hand side as well. I mean, it's just the same components, A plus C and B plus D. And so it is once more an isomorphism with respect to its additive structure. What about its multiplicative structure. If I take one matrix and multiply to another, well, okay, you can do your matrix multiplication, you get this fancy expression. If I apply the F on the left, this is going to give to you the multiplication of complex numbers, and multiply those complex numbers out, and you get the same kind of thing that we've seen before. Let me group like terms on both sides, and what you get is the same thing. I mean, there's this AC minus BD term appearing everywhere, there's this BC plus AD term, it's the same thing. And so once again, we have this function that goes between them, we get this commutative diagram, and we can say it is an isomorphism with respect to its multiplicative structure as well. And so ultimately, we will say that matrices of these form are isomorphic to the complex numbers. And, and you can play around a little bit about what structures you're considering, so it plays nicely with the additive structure and the multiplicative structure, so we sometimes call that a ring. It is also an isomorphism of real vector spaces. It is also an isomorphism of Lie groups. It depends on what your uh, structure that you want to consider. 
but for our level, we've seen how it plays well with addition and multiplication. Now let's turn to the geometric picture. If I look at all linear transformations, so all matrices A, B, C, D, there's all sorts of really cool varieties as to what these matrices are going to do as they transform the plane. However, we're not looking at all matrices, we're looking at the matrices of the form A minus B, B and A. So what do they do? So let me show you a change of variables algebraically that's gonna help us out here. If I have a value of A and B, I can put them on a right triangle and introduce a value of theta and a hypotenuse, which I will call R, which by Pythagoras is the square root of A squared plus B squared. The reason I'm saying this is I get a change of variables. Anytime I have an A, I can rewrite it as R cosine of theta and B can be R sine theta. So if I go back, say, to our matrix representation, A minus B, B, A, with this change of variables, it just looks like an R stuck out the front multiplied by something that you might recognize as a rotation matrix. Similarly, if I have A plus I, B, I can do the same change of variables. I get R cosine theta plus I times R sine of theta. And there's this incredible formula, Euler's formula, that allows you to take cosine plus I sine theta and rewrite it as E to the I theta. I've done that in a previous video, so I won't repeat it here. But this is called the polar form of the complex numbers. And it basically means you've got this stretching factor R and this rotation factor theta. And so written as R times a rotation matrix, if you change the theta value, you just get rotations of the plane. If you change the R value, you get this stretching factor. And so linear transformations of this form are not considering all possible linear transformations. They're just transformations that are compositions of rotations and stretching factors. And this is exactly what multiplication by complex numbers does. When you multiply by a complex number, you stretch your points by this stretching factor R and you rotate the points by this rotation factor of theta. And so it's not just they have the same algebraic structures. You can think of complex numbers as being not all possible transformations of the plane, but these particular transformations that are compositions of rotations and stretchings. Now, if you want to actually get better at math, then I'd strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant helps you learn math and science and computer science by putting you in the driver's seat. Whatever your interests and whatever your background, Brilliant has a huge library of lessons for you. And they are all very visual and interactive and peppered with opportunities to self-assess your progress. If you're like me, I always like to set New Year's resolutions to help me improve, but the real key to success is actually consistency. And Brilliant makes it easy to just do a little bit each day, which with consistency leads to tremendous transformations over time. It's a bit like going to the gym. By practicing math regularly, your ability to reason and problem solve can absolutely be taken to a completely different level. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, or clicking that link will give you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything that Brilliant has to offer. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.